Let us stand as we receive the family as they enter.
I'll be your presiding officer this morning over this homegoing celebration. Again, we just come to celebrate the love, the life, the labor, and the legacy of our late Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson. He was loved by many. He lived the life that he talked about. His labor would not be in vain. And he's leaving a legacy legacy behind through his family and his church members and it's so great that we had a man of God to be among us for so many years what a man of God he was as we can say now well done thy good and faithful servant well done well kind of emotional and it's something that you expect when you've been serving with someone for 33 long years I know some of y'all known him for longer than, longer than that but he's been so much to me but I'm not going to prolong because I have so much that I could say but I don't have the time to say it we're going to have our invocation coming from none other than Elder Jerry Clark. Following that, I will come back and give some more directives. Amen. Let us pray. Most blessed and heavenly Father, our God come before you this morning telling you thank you. And God, thank you for giving us the privilege and the opportunity, God, to remember and to celebrate. God, your son and faithful servant, that of Reverend Stevenson. God, we come to give you glory. We come to give you honor. We come to give you praise. God, we invite this morning your healing virtue. God, your comfort. Your power, your authority, your might. Your knowledge, God, and your wisdom. God, we need you, God. You say we can lean on you. You say we can depend on you. You say we can cast all our cares upon you. Because 
because you care for us. God, we know you're faithful. We know you're sure. God, we know that you're able. God, so we invite you in this house. Give us strength and give us knowledge. Give us understanding. Give us mercy. Give us of your love, God. God, strengthen God as only you can. God, we invite you in this house again, God. We invite you to be glorified, to be honored, and to be magnified. God, for the glory and honor belongs to you. God, help us as only you can help us. Strengthen us as only you can strengthen us. When we don't find words to say, God, not faults, God, even, God, God, forsake us, God. God, let us lean and depend on you. For we found out we can trust in you, God. We can lean and depend on you, God. God, help the family, help the friends, God. Help those, God, they don't even know what to do. God, but we can turn to you, God, for you love us and know all about us. God, have your way in this house. Move by your spirit, God. God, move by your power. God, move by your authority, God. Or move by your love. God, we need you in a time like this. So we call on you, God. Help us, Lord. God, help us. And we shall be helped. In Jesus' name, we ask it all. And the church say amen. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Amen. As we continue, one of the things Reverend Stevenson always told me when reading the scripture, he said the scripture is not that person's favorite scripture. But it's a scripture that is read to encourage the family during their time of bereavement. Sometimes it may be that person's favorite scripture, then there are other times when the ministers of the gospel, they choose a scripture that would encourage the family. So at this time, we're gonna have uh, Old Testament scripture coming from Reverend Henry Willis, following New Testament scripture coming from minister of the forest. Good morning, church. Good morning. Let the church say amen. amen. Say it like you mean it this morning, because I know you do. Today's Old Testament scripture will be coming from Psalm 73, verses 24, 25, and 26. Let us be attentive, amen, to the word of God and his blessings. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. May God add a blessing to the reader and to the hearers of his most holy, holy word. Amen. Good morning. Good morning to the family and friends. I will be reading the New Testament from the book of Timothy. Uh, Timothy uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. And it reads as, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearance. May God add a blessing to the hearers and the doers of his word.
selection. Knowing that we could lean on Jesus in spite of what's going on. Family, lean on Jesus. Look to the hills from which cometh your help. And all of your help comes from the Lord. As you've probably already done, you've probably already perused the obituary. And I know it calls to read it silently. Well, we're going to pause for just a few minutes. Just a minute. In honor of our late Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson. Reflections says limit to two minutes. And I know when the family contacted you and put you on a program, they discussed two minutes. So let's respect the family's wishes because this is what they asked for. I know they put you on a program and they said two minutes. Honor those two minutes. As a neighbor, Dr. Norris Calloway, following Dr. Calloway will be breakfast buddies. I think it's Brother Moses Adams and those who would go to breakfast with him. In that order, then I will come back. and the entire Stevenson family. They know that we are no strangers. I met Reverend and Nathaniel Stevenson and Sister Peggy Stevenson when I was in the sixth grade. They purchased their home, two homes from my parents and across the street from one of our dear neighbors, Miss Helen Rawls. They became my parents and Miss Rawls' closest neighbors and Reverend Stevenson became friends with my dad and mother, brother Moses Robinson. Reverend Stevenson loved his family. He loved you, Sister Stevenson. He often, and I can recall him saying, and I quote, Peggy has given me the best years of her life. He has even made that quote here in Hopewell. So, Miss Stevenson, I know that Reb truly loved you. To Tyrone, Maya, Orandi, Cammy, Kaylee, your dad loved each and every one of you. He often spoke to Deacon Calloway and myself, and he was proud of all the life accomplishments that each of you have accomplished. He would sometimes sit in my garage and tell Deacon Calloway how proud he was of you and how he loved his grandkids. He really loved his grandkids. Reverend Stevenson was a true man of God who demonstrated this with the love he displayed for Pastor Stanley and Sister Stanley, to the Hopewell family, and to all those he visited in the community. So when I was reflecting on the life that Reverend, Stan Reverend Stevenson lived, I went to the book of Matthew, Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Reverend Stevenson loved the Lord, and he often thanked the Lord for blessing his life. I labor Reverend Stevenson, the good neighbor. When you are a good neighbor, you seek to help those around you before they ask and when they need help. When I was younger, 
My dad was in the VA hospital in Miami, and he was discharged. I was a teenager. I didn't know how to navigate the highway of I-95 and the turnpike. I went to Reverend Stevenson, and he volunteered to bring my dad home, the good neighbor. The same day my dad got home, we had to return him back at 12 midnight. I will never forget this family for what they did for me and my mom. I knocked on Reverend Stevenson's door at 12 midnight with tears in my eyes. He opened the door, he looked at me, and he said, tell your mother I'll be right there. He gathered Brother Moses Robinson and they drove me and my mom to the VA hospital to readmit my dad, the good neighbor. Years later, my husband and I moved back to the neighborhood and we purchased a home across the street from Reverend Stevenson and Sister Stevenson and we became neighbors again. Cammy, Kaylee, Maya, and O'Rundi know that I knew their parents long before they were born. I was their babysitter, their friend, their sister, and I still am today. My last memory of the good neighbor is that it was Father's Day weekend after my husband and my husband had to go to work, so I decided to do something non-traditional. I decided to mow the lawn. The good neighbor sat on his porch and he let me struggle back and forth because <laughs> I knew I couldn't do it, but I said, Lord, I'm out here. I, I got to finish this. Send me some help. When I got to the backyard, Reverend Stevenson sat on that porch with that smirk on his face <laughs> and he said, I don't know what she thinks she's doing, but I'm going to let her know what it feels like when me and Dee cut the yard. <laughs> I was sweating. My hair was stuck to my head, and when I went headed south, I said, Lord, please send me somebody to help me because I'm going to be so embarrassed if he get here. When I turned the corner, I never asked Reverend Stevenson. He fired up his lawnmower and met me halfway in the yard. All I could do is say, thank you. <laughs> we took us 30 minutes to cut that backyard. When we finished, I went to him. I said, Rev, I don't know what I was thinking, but I know he looked at me. He was a stern. He put no filter on it. He said, Sister Calloway, what was you thinking? You know you can't handle this yard. I said, Rev, I promise you I won't never do it again. I said, but you got cake for the rest of your life. <laughs> so to the family, I want to leave this with you. We, the community, and the Northwest Six Terrace neighbors and the entire Liberty Park community will truly miss Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson. Our LP legend will never be forgotten. I am across the street. You will never have to ask. I am there. I will check on you I, as I've always done when you leave and go out of town. Cammy, you know the routine. I will check on your mom and I will be ever in touch with you guys. I love you all and stay close. giving honor to the Most High God. The great I am that I am. Pastor Stanley, all other ministers, to the family, Sister Stevenson and the family and friends. It's a great pleasure to have known Reverend Stevenson as the breakfast buddies. To me, Reverend Stevens meant this to me. Church, I have never met a man who could pray over grits and eggs as Reverend Stevens could. 
when this man pray, I enjoyed hearing him praying just like I enjoy hearing Stanley preaching the word of God, Reverend Pastor Stanley preaching the word of God. That's just how good his prayer was. And to the other deacons behind me, Reverend Stevenson was mighty special to them. If Reverend Stevens couldn't be at our breakfast every other Wednesday of the month, these gentlemen is not going to eat. I say, are y'all, are we going to eat today? They said, no, let's wait till Rev come back. And once Rev come back, we're going to eat again. Rev meant so much to us, and we love him, and we're going to miss him. Sister Stevenson, this breakfast band, it won't stop now. We'll continue to carry it, carry it on. And if you need anything from us, all you have to do is talk to us. So now as we close and take our seats, Reverend Stevens, lay there, lay there, Doc, and take your rest. We love you, but Jesus loves you best. Thank you. Hope well. Thank you, Deacon Adams and the rest of the breakfast buddies. Stevenson introduced me to Spoons as well. <laughs> and every opportunity I get, I go. Um, as a minister, Dr. Donald Preston, and as a deacon, Deacon Willis Eubanks. To God be the glory for all that he's done. He continues to do great and wonderful things in our lives, even at a time like this. I thank God and praise him for allowing me to be, as I told Maya, to be even considered a friend. Pastor Stanley and to all the other brothers that stand with me, to be a friend to Pastor Steve Stevenson. Me and Pastor Stevenson, I, I met him long before he knew me. My wife would tell me that um, Pastor Stevenson and Reverend Strong would get together and study the Bible. And they would wait on the Jehovah Witnesses to come by <laughs> and beat them up real good. So I knew Pastor Stevenson knew the word. I also know that he knew the word because Pastor Stevenson and I and Reverend Strong we took a course in um, theology. We went to the seminary together and we had a course together in hermeneutics and homiletics. That's when, we did, that's when you learn how to put a, a sermon together properly. And it was always, you know, that one student in the class who stood out. So we were given a, a task to preach on a certain topic. And I knew what was coming. They had no idea when they gave him that topic, he tore that class up. And the topic was, that it was so good, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And let me tell you, I still to this day remember it. I'm also, I was also the resident mechanic on call. I'm a certified mechanic and Reverend Stevenson would call me one day, he called me in a panic. He said, Preston, I took, my, I took my truck to the shop. And this guy, he, he did this readout for me, and I took my truck back home, and it was the, it was the Burgundy Chevy. And he said, uh, they gave me this readout, and they want to charge me big. I'm like, okay. Uh, Reverend Stevenson, let me, I told my wife, I said, Reverend Stevenson called. My wife looked at me like, you still here? <laughs> because that's how much respect we have for your family and love. And I have that same respect for you even now. So I jumped in my truck. I ran over there. I said, Brother Stevenson, let me see it. He said, he said, this man said my water pump is leaking. And I looked at it. I said, 
I didn't see any leaks. I took the truck out. I drove it. He said, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because they want to charge me all this money. I said, okay. But Reverend Stevenson, I checked the truck. And it's not leaking. There's nothing wrong with the truck. He said, I'm going out of town with my family. I'm going to Georgia. I said, Reverend Stevenson, there's nothing wrong with this truck. Long story short, he took the truck as I gave him instructions. There's nothing wrong with this truck. He said, we were at a function together. He said, Preston, I watched that needle all the way to Georgia. <laughs> and I watched that needle all the way back. And it never moved. I said this and I'm going to sit down. I said, Pastor Stevenson, and to the Stevenson family, my love, my respect, and my commitment to you and your family this day will never move just like that needle. God bless you. and everyone hearing the sound of my voice. I'm going I'm to do a short prayer for Reverend Stevens and I met him almost 10 years ago. I got to know him the first Sunday I went over to Sunday school. He was a powerful Sunday school teacher. And we met and shook hands. Like calling his name now. The spirit is all over me now. He's calling his name, and we shook hands. He said, Deep, what month you was born in? I said, I was born in May. He said, I'm November. He's 83, I'm 83. I'm going to do a short prayer, because he, he, every time I prayed, he, he called me, and when I went over to being a member of the kings and queens, every time I prayed, he would come up and shake me. He said, Deep, you pray a solid prayer. I love to hear you pray. So this morning, family, friends, members, Pastor Stanley, I'm going to do a short prayer this morning. Oh, my Father in heaven, the Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, thank you for each and every one here this morning, Lord, under the sign of my voice. Lord, look down on the family this morning, God. Oh, Heavenly Father, clean them this morning, Lord. But look, look on his children, his son and his three daughters. Oh, God, fill them up this morning with your Holy Ghost Spirit. Lord, if the head is bowed down, Lord, you the only one can pick up a bowed down head. Then, Lord, then, Lord, if tears are running down the cheeks of sorrow, oh, God, replace them with the tears of joy. Let, let them be half full of joy. And, Lord, fill them all up with faith. If their face is the size of a mustard seed, Lord, let it float from each and every one heart. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that they, the family was able to, to call me to, to, to talk about their father. And Sister Stevenson, since I met y'all, y'all in my prayers each and every morning, that God wakes me up. I, 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 I pray for the whole Hopewell family and, and my leader, Pastor Stanley and Sister Stanley, are the two leaders of this great church. God, thank you for letting me call your name again. Thank you, God. Now, I want to talk as a friend. Uh, we were having a, a Super Bowl tailgate party. The first year I might ask my wife, what could we carry around? I think the first, the first dish we brought out was, was chicken wings, baked chicken wings. 
Oh, Trekkie Wayne, not Trekkie Wayne. I'm, I'm, I'm a, my mistake. Trekkie Wayne. <laughs> and the, the next year, it's come out of here. That year, I asked my wife, could I make another dish? And I made a dish, a pot of oxtails. They sat there, they sat there to a person came by and got one and, and ate it, took it in his mouth, and the word spread it. And then Reverend Stevenson got old to one. And I don't, I don't, his daughter went to his truck and got a, a pot. He came back and filled it up. <laughs> and from that, from that time that he ate, he'd come to me every Sunday and say, D, uh, why did you cook them turkey one, uh, tur uh, oxtails? I told him. He said, I just, they just won't come out for me. And every Sunday, he would shake my hand. Every Tuesday night in Bible class, he would shake my hand. We was friends. Brother Steve was a, I, I tell you, family, he was a man among men, Brother Steve was. We, we talk about superstars. But Brother Steve was a superstar for Jesus. His, his mission was to visit the sick. He always would visit the sick. He'll come back and say something about the sick. All, all I can do, family, is tell you he's a friend until my life is gone. I always remember him walking in the west door every Sunday. And he walk in the north door for Bible class. Always sit on the third row on the west side. Always sit on the east side for Bible class around six rows back. But when Stephen is going to be missed. Lord, thank you for the family. Take care of the family now, Lord. Take care of the family. It's in your hand. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen for the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, Spirit. Amen to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Thanks for those encouraging reflections and words to the family. As we continue, we have our king and queen agent, Sister Sudie Smith, followed by as a family, Minister Janice Harris, and the Blanche Ely High School class of 1959. I think it's Brother Sam Jackson here. Okay, Representative. Okay, and after those, you will hear. Okay, after those, after those, you will hear their selection from. Praise the Lord! Oh, we have a wonderful crowd. I know this is a sad time, but. It's, it's wonderful to have the, somebody to go that have these many visitors. You know, sometimes people don't come around when, when the family needs you. But we're not having a funeral today. We're having a celebration. And I, I'm telling you, Reverend Stevenson, Reverend Stevenson was a man of God. But before I go any further, let me ask you. We are part of the King and Queen, at least a few of us. So would the King and Queen stand, please? So uh, on Thursday, we have the King and Queen. When Pastor Stan is not, oh, I'm sorry, I give honor to. <laughs> he always get me. <laughs> Because I always forget. I love you, Pastor Stan. <laughs> and to the pulpit guests. But, uh, yeah, Reverend Stevenson and another preacher, Reverend Willis, they always uh, teach when Pastor Stan is not there. And Reverend Stevenson was a 
no mess preacher. He, <laughs> he, he, when he tell you something, he meant it. He was, <laughs> but he was a good man. His whole family, I, I just loved the family. His wife, Sister Stevenson, and the family, I'm telling you, they, they good people, as we used to say. They good people. I appreciate them, and we're going to miss him. We're going to miss him a lot. I mean, the first day after he passed that next day we went to service, I mean, the church was, uh, it was, wasn't the same because he was gone. But thank God that we had him in our midst, you know, and I appreciate it. And I love the family, and we appreciate you. And Pat going to say a little something. <laughs> she ain't going to say much because she know we don't have that much time. <laughs> To God be the glory for all the things that he has done. I just want to say to the family, we love Reverend Stevenson, and Peggy know how we felt about Reverend Stevenson. He always kept us in line. Whenever we needed to know something or do something, we would always touch bases with Reverend Stevenson. I just want to say the last time we met at Bible study before he, him going into the hospital, he taught the Bible class that, that day. And he talked about the vine. I am the vine. If you abide in me, and if you ab I am the vine, but if you abide in me, he talked about the branch. And then he left us with the question, are you in the vine? Mm -hmm. I mean, he preached that lesson. Sometimes you can tell he wasn't feeling well, but he really preached that lesson that day. Mm -hmm. And we really appreciate him. And then after the Bible class, we had, we celebrated birthdays. And Peggy and I was there. I was cutting the cake, and Peggy was help serving. And Reverend Stevens said, Sister Stanley, who's going to eat all this cake? I said, I guess we are, because it was bigger than what we normally get. Mm -hmm. And he said, I know I don't need this sugar. He said, but I'm going to take a piece, and I'm going to take all the icing off, and I'm going to enjoy it when I get home. So we're going to miss uh, Reverend, Reverend Stevenson for all he did. So Sister Stevenson and family, just know that he's free now. Praise the Lord, he's free. Yeah. No more chains are holding him. Yeah. He's now resting in the arms of Jesus, and we will miss him. Thank you. all Thank you. Good morning. I have to wrap up 57 years, going on 58, of Reverend Stevenson being married to my sister, Peggy Stevenson. And I tell you what a brother-in-law he was. I wanted to just start out by saying, because I did a little research, the name Nathaniel is of Hebrew origin and means the gift of God. How about that? Other versions of the name Nathaniel or Nathaniel uh, was a disciple of Jesus, sometimes referred to as Bartholomew. Now, I never knew this until I looked it up. And it appears in both the Christian Bible and the Hebrew Bible. So I thought that was so very interesting because every time I would go to their home, Reverend Stevenson, my brother-in-law, brother-in-law, will either be studying, laying on that bed, studying, reading something particular like Sunday school lesson, or either watching TV or sleeping. Either one of those when I would go to, to the home. And I tell you, don't get him in a conversation about sports. Definitely not politics. Now those of you know it, he get really fired up about the politics. So don't start him on that. You may not stop him from talking because he was fairly quiet otherwise. So I wrote a few points, and I'm going to try to be brief. He loved to cook. Anybody here have experiences with barbecue ribs, yes. chicken, barbecue ribs, all of that? He loved to cook. He loved to cook collard greens or greens, any greens. Carla, my sister, she's going to get me. But she was the one who could swindle him. Now, we live in Leesburg, well, most of my family. And she could swindle him when we came here or he was coming there. 
I need some of your greens. She was the only one. She could get him to bring those greens, freeze them, and bring them there. Not for me, not for anybody else, but for our youngest sister, Carla. She could get those greens, and they were good. He also, he just was a person who, when he would come home to Leesburg to be with us for holidays, he thought it was so funny when my mother was living, and she would bake cakes. Everybody knew about my mother's cakes. And everybody had their favorite, and they thought she made it just for them. So Cammie, his daughter, took control over the chocolate cake. So everybody's like, she made it for her, but it's a 1,000 people in the house, but that's my cake. Same thing, he would laugh at Harold, my brother, because he liked the devil food cake. But then why was he laughing? Because Pastor Nate, he loved the coconut with the pineapple, but he would get tickled at everybody else because they wanted a certain cake. Even this past Thanksgiving, we were in Claremont at an Airbnb. He was laughing at everybody right then, remembering how everybody liked a certain cake. He just thought that was so funny. He would sit there and laugh about that. So that's a good memory for us. And another memory is how he loved his um, fishing. I, I remember he used to go deep sea fishing down here. But I believe he got that from our Uncle Willis, our Uncle George, that lived right behind my mother's house. And they loved to fish. And I think he got that love. And he fell in love with our Uncle, Uncle Willis. Matter of fact, Uncle Willis became like a second father to him. And Uncle Willis lived behind us. They barely got to town when he would hit my mother's house. In the next 10, 15 minutes, he was at Uncle Willie's house. And we were like, I guess my mother was looking like, really? Well, he would take off to Uncle Willie, but he did love, and they did go fishing. And the last thing I'm going to say is, again, he was like a second father. I said this last night. The five youngest we had, my mother had 16 children. The five youngest of us, after Sister Stevenson and, and him got married, then they moved to Pompano Beach, and they would bring us down for the summers, the five youngest of us. And he was just so excited about taking us places that we had never been, like the Sea Aquarium or He just, I mean, he was a brother-in-law. He just wanted us to experience new things, and they didn't have any children at that time, and so they just poured it out on us. And I just want my sisters and brothers, if you could stand, because we all experience, I know they don't want to, but if my sisters <laughs> and my one brother that's here, if you would stand, because we loved him so much, and for a man to approve of bringing five children for the summer, every summer. That, that says a lot about him, right? You know, because they didn't have children, they didn't have to do that. And they just poured the love on us, and we just really, really remember him for that, being so excited about making sure we did things. Oh, you can't sit in this house. Come on, let's go. And we would go. And then the last thing, because last night I talked about it, how I was here, I moved here um, right after graduating from the University of South Florida. Peggy asked me to come, told me to come. You don't have a job yet, so just come here. And I did, and I lived, it, lived with them for a year. And then after that, I moved to Fort Lauderdale, then to Miami. Then I did 31 and a half years with the state in Miami and all of that. But he, I, I, 12 years ago, I got sarcoma cancer, which is a soft nerve tissue cancer on the bottom, bottom of my femur and my back of my leg. And I tell you, they took care of me because I would be in Miami, but when I would come home, I, when I would take the treatments and everything, I would come, what I said was home, to their home. And they would take care of me. He would cook the big breakfast, which I couldn't really eat, but he loved to cook big breakfast. And they took care of me. They watched out for me. They made sure that I was okay. 
And so what I want to say is my memory is I turned him on to the frozen fruit bars. I would buy the frozen fruit bars. I didn't know he was going to fall in love with them so much that when I would go to get my frozen fruit bars, they would be missing. <laughs> and I was like, really? I turned him on to bagels. And I understood he still, still liked bagels till probably the day he died. But he was just a joy, driving me to appointments, hating Miami traffic, but he would take me to Miami to get my treatments or whatever I needed to do, the follow-up appointments. That's the kind of brother in love in law he was. So I just want to say to my sister, Peggy, we love you. We appreciate you all being like our second parents for years. Anything we needed, and I'm about to lose it, anything we needed, they were there for us. Peggy sold our clothes, bought us clothes, anything. And he was right there supporting whatever she did for us. And as I said last night, I closed with this. When I moved here from Tampa, he literally co-signed for my first car. He co-signed for my first car. That tells you a lot about Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson. Thank you. We are part of the class of 1959 Blanchile High School Tigers can tell you a different story. We can tell you something about uh, Nathaniel, Nate, our classmate, long before he became Reverend Stevens. <laughs> when we look in retrospect, we have to understand and realize that the same demeanor, the same person, the same one that you saw in later life, we saw him in his early life as, as a teenager. He had that same thing. We respected him. We know that the anointing, we know that something was special about Nate. We didn't, we didn't say bad words when he was around. We, we, we didn't do the loose talk while he was around. He, did, he didn't ask for it, but his person, his demeanor made us have that respect for him. So, Dr. Stanley, we're going to say long before he came under your leadership, that he, he was no rookie when he came here because he had to deal with a Sam Jackson. And, and a James Allen. <laughs> so he, he was well trained <laughs> to deal with people and situations. So we say to Mrs. Stevenson and all the family today that in the midst of all our losses, that God did not promise skies always blue. Flowers, strong pathways, all our lives through. God did not promise sun without rain, sorrow without pain. But God did promise strength for the day, light for the way, grace for trials, help from above, an unfailing sympathy and a never dying love. This is not a punishment, but it's a fulfillment. And that same love that picked him up the other day will pick us up. Amen. It picked us up from sinking sand. So we say, our classmate, good night, good night, good night, and sleep tight. We'll all see you but in the morning. Time. And an old man going along the highway came at the evening, cold and gray, to a chasm, vast, deep, and wide, through it was formed tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The southern stream had no fields for him, but he turned, went safe on the other side, and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man said a pit 
fellow pilgrim next to him. You're wasting strength building here. Your journey will end with the end of the day. You never again must pass this way. You've crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build your bridge at the evening tower? The old man lifted up his old head, gray head. My friend, in the past I have come. Now follow after many a day, a youth must pass this way. This chasm mean naught to me, but to that fair hair youth may, may a pitfall be, he too must cross in the twilight now. Good friend, I built the bridge for him. With that being said, after the day he will be talked about in years to come, men will refer to him in different ways. Granddaddy, Daddy, Nate, Rev, even myself, I might be looked back at the galloping ghost. But whatever name that we're referring to, let us always remember that he was a bridge builder. But such a tide is moving seeds of sleep to full of form and, and, and sound that when I bound the deep, turns again home. We will not say goodbye, classmate, but good night. Good night. night. We'll see you tomorrow. For that will be a tomorrow for all of us. God bless you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Oh, we're going to have a little church for a little while. Come and encourage you. Everybody, just go ahead and fight on. Come on, Kimmy, fight on. Put your hands together.
sword in your hand. We're still in a fight every day. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. And this time we're going to have a special son friend, Brother Anthony Jackson, followed by tributes from the children, then resolutions by Victoria Strawbridge. Stanley, uh, everybody in their respective places. In my verse, very first remembrance of my friend, and that's how we refer to each other, Reverend Stevenson, was in the late 90s. He was in the pulpit getting ready to preach. But before he started, he led with a song. Whatsoever you do for Jesus, let it be real. My friend was real. And everything he did for Jesus, it was real. In our conversations, God, family, ministry, the combination thereof was always going to be the topic. As many have said, he never engaged in gossip, slander, out of talk, and yet we talked for long periods at a time. I think the both, to, to both of our surprise, we discovered we had similar backgrounds, similar experiences, and similar dispositions. He loved the Lord with all his heart, 
with all his soul and with all his might and his neighbor as himself. In everything, he gave God thanks for everything, particularly his wife and family. He praised God for the good wife he had been given and how very well that you took care of him in those latter stages. I remember one time he called me, Brother Jackson, I just want to let you know that I just went and got my valentine for my valentine. <laughs> he think he liked cheesecakes, and so he told me what he got, how much it cost, <laughs> where I could find it at, and he always had to go by and look at them steaks. So he always added the steaks. And so while he's sitting there, he's telling me this, I'm, I'm like kind of zoning out because I'm like, for first of all, it's the beginning of tax season, so I'm kind of busy, and he could see it. I'm, I'm just zoning out because I'm like, man, it's, it's February the 11th. I ain't thinking about it. That's not even on my radar at this point. He was so discerning. He said, Brother Jackson, and this time he waited for me to answer. Brother Jackson, yes, sir. I love me some peace. <laughs> Brother Jackson, it ain't nothing like some peace. He was so very proud of his children, his grandchildren, and with good reason. The love, the care, and concern that I witnessed over the years, especially in these past three weeks, have been just astounding. And Cammie, I just cannot find the words what we at Hopewell have witnessed over all these years. He said that you forgot that she was his daughter and not his wife. <laughs> he loved Hopewell and he loved himself some Pastor Stanley, which kind of perfected our bond. He was the president of the R.C. Stanley Fan Club LLC. <laughs> and was effusive in his pride and his admiration. He told me that he made a vow to God that he would never do anything to shame you or this ministry. But you know, Reverend Stephen would cut you about Reverend Stanley. <laughs> no, he wouldn't cut you, he'd knife you. He wanted to be quick. So like many of the men, I became acquainted with my friend in, in his Sunday school class. He always studied to show himself approved and taught with high energy and excitement, usually chiding and challenging us in one area or the other. But it was this challenge. <laughs> See, can I get it? If you don't think you got anything to thank God for, come ride with me to North Broward to visit Sister Tawana Hard. <laughs> I accepted that challenge, and that set in motion the foundation of an enduring relationship. So. We get on Sister Harden's floor, and the first thing that just unsettled me was that everybody on this floor was very sick, and uh, machines just beeping, and people suffering and groaning, and I'm telling you, and, and Sister Harden seemed like her, her room was a mile away. And so I'm, you know, and they all have the rooms open. And so I'm looking in these rooms. I'm telling you, it was, it was unsettling. So I look over at my friend, and he got the Stevenson swag. 
He, he walking through the hallways waving like he President Obama. You know, everybody know him. Everybody know him. Everybody waving at him. He, everybody know him. And little did I know at that time is that not like me, who was probably one of those irritating, you know, visitors. He was a working visitor. He did, he did things for people. I had to leave the room. I couldn't stomach. I, I just couldn't take what he, some of the things he did. And so when, when we got to Harden, I tell you, you know, we all see the hard scrabble part of, 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 of Reverend Stevenson. But I saw such sensitivity. You know, he walked in a room, she was smiling. He was rubbing her head and stroking her hair, rubbing her face and you know, he always repaired, took out a piece of tissue and dabbed her side. And I'm telling you, I've never seen it in my life, but I saw a twinkle in somebody's eye. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I thought about the, 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 the amount of uh, transfiguration. Is it, Lord, do I need to be here? I mean, it was, it was that type of touching uh, that just endeared me to, to, to Reverend Stevenson. And so we, we made three more visits uh, that day, two more visits that day. And I tell you, I was drained. I was emotional, just drained, tired. My friend wanted to go to spoons. <laughs> But you know, I, one thing that, that endears me about that, that really get, glads my heart is he and Sister Harden finally got that chance to get that dance that they always talked about. Reverend Stevenson dance. Don't that just bring a smile to your face? And this and other things my friend did for decades that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Not out of duty, but out of love. Humbly. In the shadow, out of the limelight, no fanfare. The late Charles Stanley said that when you look for those to emulate, look to those doing God's work in quiet and often uncelebrated ways. That's where you find the truest beauty, the purest motives, and the trusted friends of God's kingdom. He was my trusted friend as well. This describes perfectly who Reverend Stevenson was and who I loved and wanted to emulate. So if you really want to honor Reverend Stevenson, live as he lived, love as he loved, serve as he served, visit and call the sick and the shut-in, say a kind word, do a good deed, let it be real, and follow him as he followed Christ. initially told my sister that I wasn't going to speak. Um, I, I didn't think I would be able to make it through, but 
I was listening to a podcast a few days ago and I heard some individuals talking about how much they hated their fathers. And that's not my story. You know, my dad was everything to me. I wouldn't be the man that I am today if it wasn't for my father. You know, I think about growing up because all of us had a front row seat to my father's life. You know, a lot of times we're on the outside looking in, but we had a front row seat. And I think about things that as a kid that I would see that others didn't see. You know, my dad was, he was serious about God. He was serious about his relationship with God. All of my memories, I can't count the number of times I would see my father sitting at the table studying the Bible. He was either preparing for Sunday school, preparing for his sermon, or he was just studying. I can remember as a kid, I don't know if you guys remember, we would be sitting at the table eating dinner. Someone would knock at the door and I was always sitting closest to the front door. And it would be someone, I would physically see that, you know, it was someone that was homeless, I was young. Um, but my dad would come to the door, he would ask my mom to fix him a plate of food, and he would step outside, and I don't know what they talk, talked about, but I do know he was talking to them about God. And it wasn't an isolated incident, it was several times we would be eating dinner, and someone would knock at the door, and I would see my mom fixing a plate of food, and my dad going outside and speaking with them. And as a kid, and now as an adult, you know, it taught me how to love people, how to be kind to people, how that we're a blessing to be a blessing to other people. And those are things that, you know, people don't know and that I'm so proud of, those lessons that he taught us. Uh, just lessons of being a man. You know, I heard my neighbor up here talking about cutting the grass and I, I thought I was over that, but you just brought back some memories that, that really, really had me a little upset because I always joke that, <laughs> When I learned how to cut the grass, my dad never cut the grass again. <laughs> so I heard you sit here and say that that man crunk up that lawnmower and helped you with that yard. And I know you said you were struggling. I was struggling too. I was struggling too. And I know we shared this with Pastor Stanley and Brother Jackson at the hospital, that when my dad became a grandparent, just how he changed. when it came to discipline. <laughs> now, I got all the whoopings growing up. It was some point in my life, I didn't think this man knew nothing about God the way he used to whoop me. <laughs> so when I would, as I got older and became a parent and I would try to discipline my kids and my dad would run over there and, Rhonda, you ain't gotta hit them like that. Why are you doing that to them kids? And I'm like, who is this man? You can't be the same dude that was at 1708 Northwest Six Terrace. But as crazy as that is, I appreciate all of that discipline growing up because it taught me how to respect, it taught me how to treat others. You know, it taught me how to love and, and I just thank my dad for, for everything, for teaching us how to put God first in our lives, teaching us about family, it's just so much, and it's hard to put it, his life, and what he means to me in a couple of minutes. But I just want you to know, Dad, that I love you. Thank you. And he would always tell me, you know, you got some good kids, Rondi. And I think that was his way of saying, good job, son. But no, good job, Dad. Thank you for everything that you did. Um, as many people heard before, uh, my dad was really big in prayer, and we were so blessed to be in the house that we can wake up and see him praying. We go to bed and we see it. And the biggest thing with our family was standing in a circle and having family prayer together. And yesterday it touched me so much that as much as we were hurting, in the funeral home, in front of him, we stood in our circle and we had family prayer. Regardless of where we were traveling, if it was by car, by plane, we never left his presence without praying. You all would get a chance to witness what he did in private, now in public. And we were so grateful that he imparted that in us. There was nothing too big for us, meaning 
if we would come to him thinking that something couldn't be accomplished or done, he couldn't understand why we would think that way when we had the power of God on our side. And he just really pushed, regardless of anything, just really understanding faith and prayer so that we could accomplish and get anything we wanted. And I always felt good when he would come back and say, I prayed about it, you fine. And he was, and that's exactly what happened. We will be okay. He loved his children. He loved all of us. He was so proud of us with our accomplishments. We could truly hold our heads up high because we did all that we could to make sure that daddy was okay. Um, also, with the grandchildren, he loved his grandchildren to pieces, as everybody has stated. And for Naaman and Nyla, the two of you will be graduating from high school this year. We had just talked in the hospital trying to make arrangements for him to be at your graduation. And just know that even there, even though he won't be there, of course, you know, physically, he's gonna be there watching over both of you. And I know that he has so many things that he wanted for you all to accomplish and just know that we're right here to support you along the way. When um, Tyree, my nephew, graduated from Morehouse, he was just on cloud nine. To be able, I looked at some videos the other day of daddy just crying and watching the graduate, watching him march into his graduation. Um, Nicosi, he talked a lot about you. Anytime we wanted to know what was going on, we could always ask granddad about it. And Junior, he was so happy with all that you're doing academically as well as in baseball. And Brianna and Kayvon, he also spoke a lot and was happy for them. So just want you to know as the grandchildren, he really loves you all to pieces. To Angelique, Lisa, and Steve as our spouses, thank you all for the support that you gave to dad. He loves you all just like you were his own and really cherish the relationship that you had not only with us, but also with him. Um, as mentioned before, he has special sons and brother Anthony Jackson, as well as Calvin Kelly. He really, um, really looked up highly to them and also to the other young ministers in the church that he mentored and had a chance to work with. Um, the last, his family meant the world to him and Clementine, I see you up front. You were truly a God blessing to him as his sister. Um, thank you for everything you had done, not only for daddy, but also for us as your nieces and nephews. And we thank you greatly for it, as well as his siblings that went on before him um, with my Aunt Cara Jean and uh, Uncle Prince, who he's now with. And I want to say, um, last but not least, to my mother, you were like the best to ever do it. You were an amazing wife to dad. To watch you, especially this past month, with the different challenges that dad went through. Whenever he was in the hospital, she made sure that, you know, there were certain times he probably couldn't do things for himself, but she was right there to make sure that things would be done, even if it was just cleaning them up or whatever had to be done while he was there. And I will never forget this past Easter, we all thought dad was coming home. And so she was home cooking everything that he would want for an Easter meal. And then we unfortunately found out that he wouldn't be able to be there. But you have been so supportive along the way. And I thank you and I know dad thanked you graciously for being an amazing wife and all that you were not to just him, but just to the family as a whole. And I'm truly gonna miss my dad. And to Pastor Stanley, he loved you to pieces. He only talked about you like crazy. He loved this church. So to the entire Hopewell um, Baptist Church ministry, thank you all for truly, truly being a blessing in his life. My, my memories of dad, they're always funny. Um, as I shared last night, the only sibling that could really get on dad's good, bad, and every other nerve is Cammie. <laughs> Cammie was truly the thorn in dad's flesh. My favorite and funniest memory ever, I think Cammie and I were juniors or seniors in high school, and mom had left one morning to go do errands, and Cammie and I were home cleaning. And dad was outside doing yard work. And so um, Cammy came in the kitchen and she said, Cammy, watch this. And I said, Cammy, please don't do this. I do not want to hear daddy's mouth this morning. And so she came in the kitchen and she, the window was open and she said, Daddy, Dad. And she just kept saying it and daddy was ignoring her. So probably about the 10th time, 
Daddy came to the window, and whenever Daddy was really irritated, he started stuttering. <laughs> Daddy came to the window, he said, Kick it, Kimmy, what do you want? So Kimmy was like, Daddy, I know you heard me. So he walked away and he came back. And so she just kept saying, Daddy. And finally, Daddy said, Kimmy, when you go to college, you ought to major in aggravation. <laughs> you one aggravating child. I lost it. I was done for the day. I could not get myself together for nothing. And Cammy just turned around, started laughing, went back in the uh, living room and had her whole concert. I was laughing for the whole day, so finally Daddy came in the house, and I'm literally in the hallway in tears. Daddy walks past me, he said, what's your problem? <laughs> nothing, nothing. So it was so funny to see their interaction because I would always get the effects of it. But he was such a good man, and I'm, I'm just so happy that he was my dad. Um, as Minister Preston said, I would love when Jehovah Witnesses come to the house because daddy sat out on that porch. And whenever I heard, Kaylee, bring me my Bible. I said, oh, it's about to be Bible study. <laughs> and daddy would be on the porch for an hour and a half just defending his faith and talking about the God that he served. And I love that about him. I have to say to Pastor Stanley, as I share with you in the hospital, and as Maya shared, Daddy loved you. Daddy loved Sister Stanley as well. I have never in my life, and since you've been the pastor of this church, heard Daddy say anything negative about you. I heard Daddy defend you in public, and I heard him defend you in private. When you were gone, any time that you were away, Daddy believed in order in this house, and he believed that if it wasn't happening when Pastor was here, it should not be happening when Pastor is away. I can honestly say that it was so, I, I love seeing how he not only honored you as his pastor, and he loved you as his friend, and he respected you as his friend, but he just showed us how to, just how to serve uh, pastors and how to serve in the house of God. And because of the fact that you live the life that you preach, um, I just believe that that made it so easy for, God, for a dad to follow you as you follow Christ. Good morning, folks. Uh, good morning, my beautiful brothers and sisters. I want to say uh, I'm heavily overwhelmed by what I'm witnessing today. Um, um, excuse me for a second, but um, I'm a soldier that lived way up north, and I had a family down south that knew me before I knew them, and um. My mother prepared me one day when I said I want to go see my father. So she went in a little box, like you know how the old folks do. And she pulled out a picture. She pulled out a number, an address. Said, this is your daddy. Said, do you look like him? Do you act like him? Do you walk like him? Do you talk like him? <laughs> I'm just looking at this polar picture. You know, back in the day, them pictures and, you know, technology today, I'm just seeing the dark figure and, and the picture didn't look all that great, but I smiled when I seen it. So my mama prepared me for to come see my father. And so I called him up. I was around about 30 years old. And I packed my things up in my car, drove 14 and a half hours, 15, 15, 16 hours, found the address, pulled up in the house. Maya, Ted, Cammie, Rhonda, Miss Beck. Greeted me with both arms, like I was always been there. And I will tell you right now, before I left Florida, and while I was in Florida, I felt like I belonged in Florida. All them years, I felt like my soul was there. And the family opened up their arms with, with greeting, love, and I'm glad to 
had a chance to meet them in my day. I've got to know him for 29 years. After hearing the few things I heard today and yesterday, I have some big shoes to fill. <laughs> I've heard things that's overwhelming. He's, a, he's an angel to me from what I'm hearing. He's done great things, but I was just trying to play catch up to learn my new family and my dad. With the 29 years that I got a chance to know him, I wanted more, but I take what I can get and things will went the way they went. And that's how God said it. I had a chance to see him, talk to him before things happened. And I'm thankful and grateful for that. And I'm not good with what I'm doing right now, but I've been asked to do this and I feel good that I am doing this and that everybody here with me, me speak. But I thank you for everybody accepting me. I've learned I got a lot of family down here I didn't know of. Um, I was a small family, didn't have too much. So it's kind of hard for me to, you know, I just do the best I can. So just bear with me. Time, as time goes on, I'll loosen up a little bit and then I'm gonna be just like Kayla. <laughs> but one more thing. One more thing, I will say, everybody has something to say about Kayla. And when the first day I met her, she was on me. And I'm just looking at this little girl, it's like, you know, you know, everybody else is being quiet, but Kayla's on it. She was on it, she was on it, she was on it. I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> but she never changed. She's always been the same, you know. And uh, I love them all, you know. Me and my brother talk when we get a chance. We collaborate on a few things here and there, but um, my dad was a good man. That's one thing I can say. And thank you all for accepting me here. I also want to join this church one day. Yeah, I've been trying to push myself to get down here and live here and live the rest of my life here. And after the day, I'm going to push a little harder. Because if it was meant to be, it's going to be. So thank you, folks. Love all y'all. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> I have three resolutions, two that I will acknowledge. From Sound Doctrines Ministry, Pastor Michael Ward. From Now Faith Worship Center, from Pastor Guilford. Hopewell's resolution. Resolution. But for a moment to patiently trust him, wait till the shadows are past. But for a moment look up and take courage, faith will bring vision at last. Whereas God in his infinite wisdom and divine love has called from our midst, Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson, Whereas Re Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson established his membership with the Hopewell Missionary Baptist Church when Hopewell NBC was born. In 1966, Reverend Stevenson was ordained as a deacon by Pastor Robert W. Williams. In 1993, Reverend Stevenson was called to preach under the current leadership of Dr. Robert C. Stanley. Shortly after, Reverend Stevenson was ordained as a minister in 2003. Whereas the love, whereas the family and friends of Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson are saddened at his departure, 
We know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we encourage you to think on those things. Reverend Stevenson showed the power of God through the love of his family, friends, and church. As a tribute to our love and esteem, we first resolve in humble submission. We accept the unyearing of God's will. Second, that the pastor of this Second, that the pastor and the congregation assure his loved ones of our deepest sympathy and pray that the peace of accepted sorrow may come into their lives. Third, that a copy of this resolution be given to his family and a copy be preserved in our records of the church. Humbly submitted on this 14th day of April in the year of our Lord, 2024. Sister Victoria Strobridge, church clerk, Dr. Robert C. Stanley, senior pastor, teacher. will be coming from L.C. Portillo Funeral and staff. Following that will be a selection from Hopewell Missionary Baptist Church Mass Choir. And after that, you will hear from our own Reverend Dr. Robert C. Stanley, our senior pastor. I shall hear a cry Think of me now. Don't consider me gone. Just know within your hearts that I have moved on. I've moved to a place where I am at peace. Oh, and the pain that I felt has come to cease. I know that you miss me, but please don't cry. I need you to know this is not goodbye. It's a new beginning, God has called me home. And I'm so glad to be here where I am never alone. And please believe me, I am loved here too. 
where other angels are watching over you. So I need you to be strong. I need you not to give up. For the good Lord knew my body had had enough. I'm not before you physically, but spiritually, I'll always be. I'll continue to watch over you as you did so lovingly to me. No, I love you dearly. No, I've done my best. Think of all our memories while I take time to rest. Remember the way I lived and how I still do, knowing that in spirit, I'm always there with you. So as I said before, don't consider me gone. Just know that I am happy and have peacefully moved on. At this time, the family of assistant pastor, Nathaniel Stevenson, wishes to express their sincere gratitude to each of you, their many friends, for sharing with them on this occasion as they celebrate the life and mourn the death of their loved one. At a later date, each of you will be thanked in a more personal manner for thinking of them at a time you're thinking was needed most. And now the presentation of the beautiful floral arrangements.
LC 14, I'd like to leave this with you. The angels shall sound the shout of his coming. And they tell me the sleeping, they're gonna rise from. Yes, 
Drug habits, some say. 
Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, in whom I trust. The butler, the horn of my salvation. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Honor to our Lord and once risen Savior, Jesus the Christ, who has redeemed us through his precious blood. To the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, who leads, guide, and keep us, who is the ultimate strength or our ultimate strength and comfort. To Sister Stevenson, to Tyrone and Maya and Rondi and Cammy Kaylee to Sister Clementine or Teen, Amen, McLemore, to the entire Stevenson and Robinson and everybody, to the Hopewell family, and to those of you who have come to be a source of strength encouragement as we surrender to the sovereign will of God as well as celebrate the life, labor, love, and legacy of the late Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson. Sitting there listening to those of you whom Reverend Stevenson has left an indelible mark on each of our lives. Thought about and was reminded of the eulogistic remarks of David concerning Abner, his commander-in-chief. He said in 2 Samuel 3 and 38, he said to his servants, know ye that a prince and a great man has fallen in Israel. I want to declare unto you this morning, everyone that is present, those in the virtual space, a great man, great husband, great father, great grandfather, great brother, great brother-in-law, great cousin, great friend, great assistant pastor, great member of the body of Christ has fallen this day in the city of Pompano Beach, the Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson. Thought about this moment. Thought about what could I say to the Stevenson's family, to the Hopewell family and friends that would really encourage our hearts in this moment. And I was reminded of Reverend Stevenson's unwavering loyalty and dedication to God and the things of God. He was serious about his God. He was loyal. I've come to learn after pastoring for almost 35 years that loyalty is really a character quality. A lot of people don't even know what it means to be loyal. According to, to Webster, 
he suggests that loyalty is, or it implies, a faithfulness to be steadfast in the face of any temptation that will cause one to renounce, desert, or betray. In fact, it goes on to suggest that a lawyer person is a person that is being honest, trustworthy, supportive, generous. In fact, a lawyer person is faithful even when they're not in the presence of the person they're loyal to. Loyal person will speak good things about that person even when they are not around. In fact, Loyalty is an action by which a person decides that they're going to stick with, stand by a person to the very end. Don't miss this. Even when they don't want to. And I submit to you this morning that Reverend Stevenson's photograph should be next to these definitions of loyalty because he was the epitome of loyalty. So, you know, I thought about his loyalty and what, what character in the Bible that I could find that, that would represent the kind of loyalty that I have witnessed in Reverend Stevenson? So you Bible scholars, you know. You, I came across Job. Job was committed in his daily prayer to God. Job always thank God for the abundant blessings that he received. I thought about Ruth. Ruth remained bound to her mother-in-law, Naomi, even in times of trouble. I thought about David and his continual love for his close friend, Jonathan. Loved him even to the point of Jonathan being slain in battle. Thought about the Apostle John, who stood at the cross of Jesus, a loyal friend who loved him unto the end. But Sister Stevenson, none of those biblical characters were able to describe the magnitude of loyalty that your husband had. He was loyal. And so, Sister Janice, you gave confirmation because I thought about that same disciple. And even though this disciple is really known for being guileless, but his loyalty is manifest in his integrity and his willingness to respond immediately to God, in this case, Jesus. You get it right, Sister Harris, 
or Minister Harris, Nathaniel. The disciple Nathaniel shares the first name of Reverend Stevenson. And as Sister Harris alluded to, he's only mentioned six times as Nathaniel, and that is in the Gospel of John. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, he is called Bartholomew, which is really a surname that is consisting of one's father or an ancestor. She had it right. His name actually means a gift of God. Nathan, gift, El, a name of God, gift of God. When I was walking through this, I said to myself, don't, don't tarry too long, Reverend. Because Reverend Stevenson was a gift of God. A gift that was shared not only among his immediate family, among his church family. He was a gift to Hopewell. Some might say that Reverend Stanley is a gift to Hopewell. Well, if Reverend Stanley is a gift to Hopewell, and that's just something that is being suggested hypothetically, let me tell you a fact. Reverend Stevenson was a gift of God for Reverend Stanley. Nathaniel. It is interesting because we're told in the Gospel of John, chapter number 1, verses 45 down to 41 about this Godless man. You read that passage, here's what you will discover. And that is after Philip meets Jesus, immediately Philip runs to his friend, Nathaniel. He was, if you will, bursting with energy. He was excited about the fact that Jesus had found him and he wanted his friend to know about it. He says to his friend, we have found him whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. You got to understand now that uh, Philip and Nathaniel were studying buddies. And you've heard it alluded to that Reverend Stevenson was very astute. He was a studier of God's word. But these two friends, Philip and Nathaniel, they would examine the Old Testament scriptures. And in those Old Testament scriptures, they would find in the prophecy uh, where Jesus would be the Messiah and he would come, amen, to rescue them. But they also understood what the prophecy said about Moses himself, that Jesus would be as a prophet like him. Imagine just for a moment, I'm going to get where I'm going, and here's what I want you to see is that when Philip shows up, he tells uh, Nathaniel that we have found him. Philip or Nathaniel is excited. But it is when Philip says, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. All of a sudden, the wind went out of uh, Nathaniel's sail. Why, 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 Reverend? Because immediately, Nathaniel began to think about the city of Nazareth. And here is those disappointing words for some. And that is when he says in that 43rd, or rather 46th verse, amen, can there any good thing 
come out of Nazareth. Nathan has gotten a bad rap. Because many has taken those words to suggest that, that, that Nathan is prejudiced. That, that, Nathan, that, that, that Nathan is, or Nathaniel is, condescending. But the truth of the matter is, Nathaniel lived in Cana, which was only five miles from Nazareth. And he had heard about, amen, the shenanigans, if you will, or how unsavory and nasty they were in Nazareth. Now, now I, I, I ain't trying to bother nobody, but here's what you need to understand. Yes, he was wrong in his conclusion because we know something good came out of, of, of Nazareth. But he was right in his commentary because he was a study of God's word in the Old Testament the Messiah was coming out of Bethlehem and not Nazareth. And so he basically says, amen, to uh, Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? If you read the text and you pay close attention to how Philip responded, Philip knew that his commentary was right. And so Philip did not try to change Nathaniel's mind. He simply said, come and see. And Nathaniel came and saw. And the text says that immediately when Jesus sees Nathaniel, he says, an Israelite indeed, one whom there is no guile. Immediately, you got to ask yourself the question, what exactly does Jesus mean? When he says, an Israelite indeed, it's almost like somebody saying they are a Christian. An Israelite indeed does not simply mean based on one's pedigree that they were born an Israelite, but rather they are walking worthy of the name Israelite, which seems to suggest that it, it really involves a person, a man having piety, a person being in obedience to God and to God's law. It's kind of like folks say they're Christians, but they're not obedient to God's word, to God's law, if you will. But then he says, no God. In other words, no deceit, no fraud, no hypocrisy. Now, now, he did not say that Nathaniel was a man without any guilt or sin. What he was saying was that Nathaniel was an honest, sincere, and upright man. Nathaniel, Reverend Stevenson, Nathaniel, Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson, honest, sincere, upright man. But watch this. Immediately, Nathaniel says to Jesus, which knoweth thou me? Jesus then replies and said, before Philip came to you under the fig tree, the verse says, I saw you. Immediately, Nathaniel's disposition changes because the suggestion is that something spiritually happened to Nathaniel under that fig tree. In fact, Bible scholars suggest that it's possible that Nathan was studying about Jacob, who was everything but 
a guileless person. He was filled with subtlety. He was a trickster. But the suggestion is that he was reading perhaps that text. And if you would just let me give you this information parenthetically, what really happens is that Jesus then says to him, in essence, when he said, I saw you, he was telling Nathaniel that he was, he experienced, he saw the experience that only he knew he had with God. In fact, the suggestion is from Genesis 28 and 12 that, that Jacob had a dream and he saw a man, a ladder, and he saw angels ascending and descending. And Jesus would say around verse 51, he says to him that the heavens will open and you will see a ladder with angels ascending and descending. But he was telling him that I'm that ladder. So when Jesus said, I saw you, immediately Philip understood that Jesus was more than just some uh, bootlegger out of Nazareth. He knew that Jesus was not some self-proclaimed prophet, someone who saw a man uh, those of us who deal with the word of God as a, as a sport, as something I want to do because that looks cool. But here is what Nathaniel says. Thou art the son of God, the king of Israel. He basically acknowledges his deity as the son of God and he acknowledges his destiny as the king of Israel. And when Nathan had that experience, here is what the text simply suggests to us is that Nathan from that very moment became a follower of Jesus. Nathan did not need 34 years to be convinced that Stanley was the man of God. Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson didn't need but just to invite me one time in 1989 as a guest speaker of the Hopewell Missionary Baptist Church and he heard something and saw something that there were many of the others in the congregation did not see. It didn't take him five years to acknowledge that Rem Stanley was not just somebody showing up in Pompano, but somebody that God had called to be in Pompano. So, 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 so I'm, I'm, I'm almost finished because I got to get to, I got to get to the sermon. Now, y'all be kind now. I, I sat there patiently. I ain't bother nobody. I was trying to keep myself emotionally in check while y'all was saying all that tear-jerking stuff. So y'all sit there and give me an opportunity. So, so, so here it is. So here it is. So here it is when, when I look at the the disciple Nathan, and I, I look at Nathan, amen, Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson. When I, when, when I see them, I see a parallel. I see the integrity. I see the immediate willingness to follow Christ as being paramount. And so, and so I just want to submit to you, family. I want to submit to those of us who are here Today, that Reverend Nathaniel Stevenson is a portrait of a loyal servant. If you ever want to emulate, if you ever want to see loyalty 
in real time, just be reminded of what you witnessed in the life of Reverend Stevenson. His loyalty could be witnessed in his personal faith. It can be witnessed in his personal faith and how he exhibited it. He understood, amen, that being saved didn't mean that you become now a closet Christian. Amen. But for him, he understood that his personal faith should be exhibited. And the very first thing that we discover that he exhibited to us was his relationship with the Christ. Now, I don't want to be redundant. It has already been argued that Reverend Stevenson was saved for real. Emphasis on real. Brother Jackson made observation of real. We're living in a synthetic society. We're living in a time where people are in denial. They don't want to admit that they're idolaters. They don't want to admit that they're not serving God. They have not accepted him with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. But Reverend Stevenson, when he followed Romans 10, 9, and 10, and he confessed with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in his heart that God raised him from the dead, he knew that he would be saved. And then he act like somebody that was saved. I ain't got no help in here. He knew what it meant to be a son of God and not having your name on the road. Nobody don't care about no church you join. Ain't no salvation in no brick and mortar. Amen. He understood what John said. John 1 and 12 says, but as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. His relationship, he exhibited his relationship in Christ. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 and 5 and 17, rather, it lets us know if any man be in Christ. Got no help in here. This is, I'm sorry if however y'all feel. That, that that's my friend. And if I'm a long ranger, that's got to be Tonto. And if I'm Batman, that, that, that's got to be Robin. And if I'm David, that has to be Jonathan. You're a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. He exhibited in his relationship with Christ. He wasn't playing. You ever, you ever heard the say, I know you have. It says game, no game. And so when he heard the young 32-year-old Stanley preaching, amen, his heart out to about 25 members at the Hope World Church, amen. You see, being born again meant born again. So, so he exhibited his relationship, amen, with the Christ. But watch this. Uh, he also exhibited his reverence for the call. That's a problem with those who have got up and went. There's no reverence for the call. Here is what Reverend Stevenson and I shared, and every preacher has been called of God for real. And that is what uh, uh, the Word of God says in 1 Timothy 1 and 12. There, Timothy, Paul simply says to Timothy, listen, I thank God. The Lord Jesus, amen, who has enabled me, for he has found me faithful, putting me in the ministry. In other words, Eugene Peterson would say it this way, he went out on a limb for me. And Reverend Stevenson understood, just like Reverend Stanley, understand there's nothing so great about me, amen. I ain't no top feeder, amen, but God found me faithful. God found Reverend Stevenson's faithful, and he reverenced his call. He realized, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and 16, he said, though 
though I preach the gospel. I have nothing to glory in, for necessity is laid upon me. And woe unto me if I preach not the I don't care if you don't like how I split verbs. I don't care if I don't impress you with my vocabulary. You, you got to understand, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those of us who have been called sometime people will make you feel like you don't have what it takes because you are not like some other puppet that has learned how a man to be an orator. But those of us who have been called of God, amen, we know it's not about how we talk. It's about what you know. Yeah, you know, people size you up because you don't sound like a somebody. Oh, yeah, 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 man, you got to sound like them. You know, you can't be, you know, you got to have the right mannerisms. But when, 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 when your reverence for the call is serious. You don't care what nobody say. Can mama say, daddy say, hu husband say, wife say. Listen, a call. I think the Bible says in Luke, there it is, Luke 9 uh, uh, and 62, said no man put his, his hand on, on the plow and look it back his fit for the king. Listen, man, those of us who are called and Reverend Stevenson took his call seriously. You heard him. Yes, you did. You heard him. They, were, they weren't telling it like, it, like I'm going to tell it right now. But, but you heard him alluding to how some of them would behave when I'd go on vacation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But because he reverenced his call, he wasn't like some people, you know, they can't handle riding in the second chariot. That's why they'll never be able to get in the first chariot because they envy the person that's in the first chariot. <laughs> Reverend Stevenson didn't seize that opportunity behind my back to try to gain the congregation, amen, so he can get a following. Amen. Yeah, 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 yeah. There were folk bringing crazy stuff to him, and he, just like you heard his children say, he would set them straight. You know why? Because he was loyal. He wasn't a hypocrite. That's why he was the same when I left. Let me tell you something. This y'all be happy to know this. Those of you who know how you behave when I was gone, let me tell you how much that he loved his pastor. He wouldn't even tell me that stuff. You know who told on y'all? The people you were doing it with. Those who did. He didn't tell. He didn't tell on you. Bringing that nonsense to him. Asking him to do stuff that you know the pastor only does. And so, Kaylee, you, you, you pique my heart. Because in this whole idea of, of the reverence of his call, you're right. Perish the thought for those of you who don't even know what it means to be loyal. Reverend Stevenson was not respecting my position. Anybody who respects the position and let the person in the position live an immoral and ungodly life, you are not loyal, you are a, an idolatrous. He was loyal, as his daughter said, because, amen, he saw a preacher that was striving to live as holy as a sinner saved by grace can live. He saw a preacher saying, follow me as I follow Christ. And he took me serious, like Brother Jackson took him serious, and started visiting with him. He watched me, amen, from the moment he heard me, and there was no reason for him not to be loyal to me. Now, what's your problem? I know what your problem You're not loyal. That's what he does for us. He shows us. What, nobody's flunky? He, he saw someone that was living according to the word of God, and, and it was right for him, as it, as it is for everyone else, to follow someone who's following Christ. 
So, 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 so his reverence, he reverenced his call. He exhibited that. And he also, if you will, exhibited his responsibility to the church. He loved, as it has already been said, the Hopewell Church. Loved it before, long before I got here. Loved it the moment he joined. I'm talking about real love. I'm talking about that play play stuff. Real love. Real love is demonstrated and manifested in our time, talent, and treasure. I hope I wasn't speaking too fast when I said a person with loyalty, amen, is being honest and trustworthy and, and supportive and generous. I was humbled, Brother Tyrone, that you were going to consider at some point joining the Great Hopewell Baptist Church. And I'm honored that you have accept, accepted the challenge, amen, to feel those brogans. That's what we call them. When, them. when them shoes real big, we call them brogans. And so if you don't feel those shoes, you need to, you need to, you need to know uh, that he was an honest, he was a trustworthy, he was a supportive, and he was generous. He wasn't stingy. You ought not have money. You ought not have probably given something to somebody that's a lawyer, somebody that's striving to live his whole as a sinner saved by grace can live. Amen. There's some cats around town, amen, living lives contrary. All they do is get a, get a, get a, get a, get a, get a money line and they line up. They don't, have, they don't care who he was with last night. He loved the church. And he exhibited his love for the church. He was not slow for in business as Romans 12 and 11 tells us, but he was fervent in spirit serving the Lord. You heard it already been said that he would serve in, with a fervent spirit. Nobody is insensitive to pain. Nobody, everybody knows when you're not at your best. But yet, Reverend Stevenson would show up, amen, and he would, do every, give every, he would give everything that he had. He would expend all of his energy trying to get folk who could flip and jump to praise God. And so, Reverend Bunyan, that's the hard preaching. Because... We see his loyalty witness in the personal faith he exhibited. But, but we also, we also, we also, we also, we also see uh, 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 his loyalty exhibited in the precious family he esteemed. You heard it. He was an example of, of how a man ought to love his family. It has already been said, amen. And, and Brother Jackson has shared something, amen, that Reverend Stevenson did not share with me. But I know and knew beyond any doubt that he was a committed partner to Sister Stevenson. Amen. I'm trying to remember his nickname, Ghost, Galloping Ghost. Listen, I, at the risk of indicting myself, you got a cool name like Galloping Ghost. You got to fight sisters off you. But, but, but he was committed to Sister Stevenson for 57 years. Don't raise your hand. Some folk haven't been married for 57 days, 57 months. But for 57 years, he understood what the Word of God said in Genesis, amen, 2, 23, 24. Listen, you are bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. We're no longer two. I'm going to leave mother and father and cleave to you, and we're going to be one flesh. He loved her. And I was listening very attentively. And I heard when Maya spoke of how Sister Stevenson was right there for his ever-becking call. 
Got to understand something for those of you who are not married. You don't do that just because your name on the marriage certificate. But you do that because of what Paul said in uh, 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 Ephesians 5 and 25. He says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And then earlier he says to the wives, submit unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. This is for free. Here is how it works. The, we, the, the, the reason Sister Stevenson was able to submit was because of Reverend Stevenson's sacrifice. She saw how he loved her. She saw how he cared for her. And how could you not submit to a husband like that? I got one like that myself. But it's not because her name is on our marriage, the wedding certificate or marriage certificate. It is because of sacrifice. He was a committed partner. And an example to the house. Y'all looked in that program, and I was trying to figure it out, Sister Steve, so I didn't know if that was trick photography or if y'all just decided to do that together. Uh, but I saw where Maya and Steve and you and him were kissing at the same time on the same pictures. Now, I don't know if that was, I don't know, I don't know. But I was impressed. <laughs> Amen. Because the reality is, Amen. Reverend Stevenson, he really recognized he had a precious family that was worthy to be esteemed. So he was a committed partner. He was, I want to call it a conscientious parent. He, he paid attention to his children. You, you've already heard the report. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just doing, I'm just doing my part. He was able to put his children on the right track. Some of us, it's not your fault, started out on the bad track. Amen. The Bible says in the 127th Psalm around verse 24 and 5, it talks about how children are a gift for God and blessed is the man whose quiver is full. It talks about as arrows are in the hands of a strong man, which seems to suggest, amen, that fathers have the ability with those arrows, those children, to point them in the right direction. And this has much to do, as the scripture says, train up a child in the way they should go, that when they're old, they will not part. That's not a promise, that's instructions. And so if you show some direction and some, uh, 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 and, 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 and some determination or demonstration and discipline, then they will go in the trajectory of which you point them. And that's why his children, his, 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 all of his children are educated. I'm not suggesting if yours are not that you didn't do that. I'm making the point that it mattered. It mattered, as you heard them say, for his children to see him praying. What an indictment for your child to say to his, his or her counselor when they suggest to them the power of prayer that they say, I've never seen my parents pray. He didn't drop them off to church. He brought them to church. And then after they heard the word of God, he helped them to understand and, and implement what they heard. So he was this committed partner, he was this conscientious parent, and he was a caring grandpa. You've already heard how he loved his grandchildren. And the Bible simply says, amen, that a good man will leave an inheritance for his children and his children's children. Now, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, we think inheritance has to do with this. But you're right, an, an, an inheritance is something that you leave someone. A legacy is something that you leave in someone. But Reverend Stevenson understood what it meant, what it really meant to give an inheritance. Can I help somebody out? He understood if his son or his daughters needed his assistance and he had, amen, the wherewithal to assist, he did not say, you can't get it till I go to heaven. I ain't got no help in here. Some of y'all say, what is this reverend talking about? 
your, your, your child needs your help now. My son ought not to wait till I die to get what I put in there for him when he needs assistance now. They ain't going to raise their hand. At least they're not going to raise it real fast. But I know there was some time, long time ago, especially the one that was majoring in agitation. I know she was asking for some money. Here's the point. He loved his grandchildren. He cared for them. The little time that we shared after God had called him home, they were talking about how he loved and he just adored little Aranda Jr. They loved, he loved them and they loved him. And so that's the kind of great man, great leader, great friend that the Hopewell family and thank you Stevenson family for, for allowing us to have this home going service during the time of our worship service. Why? Because he, he meant that, that much to all of us. Oh, how I, how I wish Reverend Bunyan that I could really, really walk down memory lane. Oh, I wish how I could really tell you, amen, how Reverend Stevenson uh, stood by my side. You, you heard me give the definition, amen, about loyalty is an action in which a person, amen, decides that they're going to stick with and stand by a person even to the end, even if they don't want to. When you make up in your mind, doesn't matter what anybody else says, I'm going to stand by this man or this woman's side. And I've already argued with you, amen, the reason that he, amen, stood and stuck with me, it wasn't because of my ability to proclaim the word of God. It was because he saw something, amen, in my life. And I would be remiss if I allow anyone to think for one moment what you have witnessed happen over here, amen, on 15th Street was all because of Reverend Stanley. If it had not been for the council, if it had not been for the support, if it had not been for him running interference, if it had not been for him making sure that the natives were restless, I'm here to, that was restful. I'm here to tell you, amen, that we perhaps would not be in this sanctuary right now. Don't you think for one moment it was all because of Reverend Stanley? No, it had a lot to do with my co-laborer. It had a lot to do with the assistant pastor. You don't know what it means when you leave the church where you have been assigned to serve and you can leave someone there and you can go on vacation and not worry about what's going on at the church. You talking about missing somebody. My whole world, my pastoral world has been turned upside down. I've already told you that his name is Nathan. I've already told you that God declared that Nathan had no guile, which means that he is or was an honest man, trustworthy man. And I believe that God will make a way so that I will again not have another right hand because I found out that if you lose your right hand, you don't get an opportunity to grow one back. So I'm not trying to grow back a right hand, but I know that there are prosthetics uh, that can serve me good until uh, the Lord say so. Uh, I didn't mean to go that way, y'all, but there's something on the inside of me. Uh, I got one more point uh, that I want to share about this great man of loyalty. Uh, yes, his loyalty is witness uh, in his, the personal faith he exhibited. Uh, his loyalty is witness in the precious family he esteemed. Uh, but his loyalty was also witness in the promised future uh, that he embraced. Uh, you see, he would often stand right behind this sacred desk uh, and he would remind those 
who thought they could get away with not going to either destination, uh, that they had another thought coming. Uh, and he would often say that there's only two places uh, that you're going to be able to go. Uh, and you are not smart enough to miss both of them. Uh, he wanted them to know that there was a future uh, that they needed to embrace. Uh, and so here is what I know for a fact. Uh, I know that he understood the promises of God uh, and that God had promised him uh, a pre-arranged residence. Uh, you see, he knew this home or this house rather uh, or this body was not his uh, to keep forever. Uh, he understood that this body would eventually uh, have to go back to the clay, uh, have to go back to the ground uh, from which it came from. Uh, but he understood what the word said uh, in 2 Chronicles, uh, or rather 2 Corinthians, uh, the Bible says in 5 and 1, uh, and we know uh, if this earthly house uh, of this tabernacle, uh, it was dissolved, uh, we have a building, uh, a building of God, uh, a house uh, not made by hands, uh, eternal uh, in the heavens. Uh, when I went to visit him uh, on Resurrection Sunday evening, uh, and he and I were talking, uh, and he said, Reverend, uh, I'm falling apart. Uh, and I said to him, uh, I said, Reverend, uh, you know you and I uh, don't have any agreements uh, or disagreements. Uh, but I can't agree with you uh, that you're falling apart. Uh, what else did you expect uh, me to say? Uh, yeah, Reverend, uh, you are falling apart. Uh, but what he was really saying, uh, he was saying, Pastor, uh, I'm decreasing. Uh, but even though I'm decreasing, uh, I am increasing. Uh, because he understood uh, that the house that he was living in, uh, he had been sending uh, up his timber uh, and his house uh, was now ready uh, to be moved in uh, and I can hear him uh, in my mind's eye now. Uh, he said Reverend, uh, I got another building, uh, a house not made by hands uh, and then I can imagine uh, him being reminded uh, of the promise of God. Uh, Let not uh, your heart be be troubled. Uh, you believe in God? Uh, also believe in me. Uh, in my father's house, uh, there are many mansions. Uh, if it was not so, uh, I wouldn't have told you. Uh, but I'm going away uh, to prepare a place uh, that where I am, uh, you may be also. Uh, he really uh, embraced the promises uh, of God. Uh, he embraced uh, the promise uh, of a prearranged residence. Uh, he embraced uh, the promise uh, of a predetermined uh, reward. Uh, he understood uh, that one of these days uh, that the son himself uh, was going to come back uh, in all of his glory uh, and that he would uh, give every man uh, according uh, as his work uh, that's what Paul said. Uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians uh, 5 and 10, uh, we all uh, must stand uh, before the judgment seat uh, of our Christ uh, and give account uh, of the things uh, that was done in our bodies, uh, whether good uh, or bad. Uh, where the good news is, uh, he understood uh, his predetermined uh, reward. Uh, and I can imagine uh, in my mind's eye, uh, little uh, did I know uh, when I walked away uh, and left the hospital uh, on Resurrection Sunday evening uh, that he understood uh, that God uh, was getting ready uh, to take him uh, to his new house. Uh, I wasn't there, uh, but just like the family, uh, I was expecting uh, the next morning, Monday, uh, to hear that all was well. Uh, but instead, uh, 
we found ourselves uh, trusting God, uh, asking him uh, to let his will be done. Uh, even though we understood, uh, we wanted uh, our will to be done. Uh, but what we did not know, uh, while you, we had left, uh, he had a conversation with his God. Uh, and I can imagine in my mind's eye, uh, he said the same thing uh, that Paul said uh, when they came down uh, in the Roman jail uh, to take him uh, to Nero's chopping block. Uh, I can hear him say, uh, I'm ready uh, to be offered up. Uh, the time uh, of my departure uh, is at hand. Uh, I fought a good fight. Uh, I finished the course. Uh, I've kept the faith uh, and henceforth uh, it's laid up for me uh, a crown of righteousness uh, which the righteous judge uh, should give to me uh, in that day. Uh, but I heard Paul say, uh, not to me only, uh, but to all those uh, who love his appearing. Uh, all I got to say uh, is that he was ready. Uh, and when he made that declaration, uh, amen, uh, I don't know uh, what it feels like uh, to be transitioning uh, from this world uh, into eternal life. Uh, but all I know uh, is on this side, uh, on April, uh, April 3rd, uh, Reverend Stevenson, uh, he climbed uh, his last mountain. Uh, he crossed uh, his last valley. Uh, he carried uh, his last cross. Uh, he endured uh, his last pain. Uh, he prayed uh, his last prayer. Uh, he cried uh, his last tear. Uh, and I want you to know uh, on April, uh, April 3rd, uh, the Lord uh, swung his chariot down uh, and took my friend, uh, took your husband, uh, took your father, uh, took your grandfather. Uh, but I stopped by to tell you, uh, I remember, Sister Stevenson, uh, what you said to me uh, and those who were around. Uh, you said, Reverend, uh, Nate's eyes were closed. Uh, and I asked him, uh, what do you see? Uh, and he said, uh, I see two big lights uh, and a whole lot of other lights. Uh, but his eyes were closed uh, and he was seeing light. Uh, and I thought about uh, that holy city. Uh, I ain't got no help in here. Uh, that holy city uh, where God's glory uh, is the light. Uh, that city uh, where uh, the gates of pearl, uh, they proclaim the light. Uh, the streets of gold, uh, they reflect the light. Uh, the river of life, uh, it multiplies the light. Uh, the tree of light, uh, it manifests the light. Uh, the angels, uh, they magnify the light. Uh, the city, uh, it glows the light. Uh, and the saints, uh, it prays the light. Uh, and the good news is, uh, when he saw the light, uh, it wasn't uh, a train, uh, but it was. Uh, it was his, uh, it was his escort uh, to go home. Uh, and I don't know about you, uh, I'm going to see uh, my friend, uh, my confidant, uh, the man who stuck with me, uh, the man who stood by my side. Uh, I'll see him again uh, because I don't know about you, uh, but one glad morning, uh, when this life is over, I too uh, shall fly away uh, to a home uh, on God's celestial shores. Uh, I shall uh, fly away. Uh, is there anybody in here? Uh, your heart is fixed. Uh, your mind is made up. Uh, you are on your way uh, to see the king. Uh, if you are here, uh, wave your hands uh, and say, yeah. Say yeah! Say yeah! I can hear. I can hear Reverend Stevenson simply joining in 
will not simply be climbing. Ah, I know he's all right. Ah, I know he's all right. I know he's all right. And not only is our God all right, but my brother is all right. Your father is all right. Your husband is all right. Your friend is all right. And as we say and I conclude, my friend, my confidant, my loyal, Assistant pastor, my lawyer friend, you have beat me there, but you can't crown him until I get there.
together. For the rest.
just before we leave this morning, for those this evening, this afternoon, for those of you that will be a part of the committal on tomorrow morning, we're going to be meeting here at the church at 9 uh, a.m. to go over to the cemetery to do the committal. So those of you who would like to be a part of that, we're going to line up right here at the Home World Church at 9 a.m. Thank you.